This is Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. A podcast. Red Pub Pod. From Red Hog Publications. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. This is Red Pub Pod, coming to you live from the plush welded studios at Catawba Valley Community College. This is Red Hawk Publications, and today we're going to have kind of a special show. We've got several books in our roster that we were fortunate enough to uh, publish and uh, get done during COVID. So what we want to do with some of these books is we want to tell you about them and promote them a little bit because they missed promotion and missed being able to get out there during the COVID lockdown. So today, Miss Patty Thompson is with me to help me out, and we are going to talk to Kira Freeman. Hi, Kira. Hello. Kira is the author of the book of poetry called Second Life, Poems of Reemerging. And again, this is a book that was uh, that came to us uh, through a contest. Can you tell us about that contest? And then I'll tell everybody about your bio and everything like that. But tell them about the contest first, because this is a cool story. Well, I will. We have a local independent bookstore in Morganton, where I live, and they have a contest. They've had a couple of years of a poetry contest um, uh, for the month of April. And so I'd entered it one year and came in second. And I entered it the second year, and the pot had been sweetened. And had been sweetened. How had the pot been sweetened? The pot had been sweetened by the addition of uh, Red Hook Publications was going to publish a chapbook of the winning poet uh, that would be offered a few copies, uh, my understanding was, um, a few copies for the author as part of the prize, the winning author, and then um, some to be sold at the store Adventure Bound Books. And then what happened? What was the amazing thing that happened? The amazing thing that had happened is actually I had written plenty of other poems besides those ones I had put into the contest um, and been taking photographs. And I submitted a manuscript expecting that I, you know, maybe would get to have this book that I could maybe give to my mother. <laughs> maybe my father, you know, and, and, and my children might be embarrassed by it. And, and, and that would be about as far as it went. Right. Um, I've always wanted to be a published author, but I haven't really put that as a priority in my life. I just quietly write things, don't save them, occasionally enter contests. And you know what they say about when you're not looking for something, that's exactly when it comes to you because we here at Red Hawk Publications, we're going to, I think we're going to print like 25 copies. Isn't that, that was, what we're going to yeah. do for Angela down yeah. there and for the, for the winner? Yeah. But the poetry was so good, the photographs so good, that we decided to go ahead and offer you a contract and publish this thing and make you part of our family. And if you don't mind, I'll jump in. I, I was surprised but very happy for you, Kira, simply because I remember saying to Robert, we're only doing a short run on this, 25 copies, it's a chat book. And the next thing I know, he's like, no, we're, we're publishing this. And I'm like, why? He's like, have you read it? And then I had to go back through it, and I'm like, oh, yeah. It was very special. It was beyond chat book level. In other words, it really was worthy of publishing. So we want to thank you. And of course, shameless plug for Adventure Bound Books and Dr. Angela Shores, who runs the store in Morganton. Um, well done. We were very fortunate. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why we want to do this uh, special show to help you realize that this book is out there. It is available on our website at uh, redhawkpublications.com. It's $15, and you're getting images, and you're getting terrific poetry. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But first, let's tell the, the listeners a little bit about Kira. She's the 2021 ABB Poetry Contest winner. We went over that. And uh, has published poetry in the Asheville Storytelling Circles newsletter. And personal stories have been featured on 88.7 WNCW's Word Stage. That sounds interesting. Uh, her poetry is steeped in the small moments of everyday experience. I think that's one of the things that I fell in love with. And draws inspiration from nature in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in Vermont and North Carolina. And in addition to her poetry and photography, Kira spends your, you spend your free time telling stories, writing silly songs, reading voraciously, dancing in the kitchen and going outside in the yard as much as possible. And you live in Morganton? I do. With your husband, whose name is? Mel. Mel. He's a nice guy. I met him a, a couple weeks ago. And daughters, cat, and a dog. 
Is there and actually, my mother-in-law also now lives with us. Your mother-in-law has moved in. Yes. Oh, I'm sure she's in fact, a very nice lady. During the publication of this, she was, in fact, living with us, but we were not sure how long she'd be there. Yeah, there's lots of people moved in together during the COVID lockdowns and things like that. Uh, first of all, you, you've got a Shelby Stevenson forward in this book. How in the world did you get Shelby Stevenson to say such wonderful things about your poetry? I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, so there was uh, an event um, that the beauty of Zoom, um, sometimes when you share events via Zoom, um, you get to interact with interesting people that you might not otherwise meet face to face. Uh, so this is a Red Hawk publishing event where he, mostly he was reading his poetry, but as the winner, I had a, I got to read the winning poem. And this was before your book was published? Yes. Yes. I could see I was kind of out of it a lot during those Zoom meetings because we were all locked up and I was in my basement seven days a week. And, and If I recall correctly, when we put that one together, we thought we would do the senior statesman poet, which would be Shelby. Right. And you were the ingenue, up and coming. And so we paired you guys specifically because we had someone, you know, stately and someone who was new on the scene. He had an opportunity to read your book as part of doing that interview. And he really was impressed, Kara. So I just decided when he said he really liked it, and I'm like, would you mind doing an advanced praise blurb? He's like, he'd be happy to. And that's how that happened. So. Yep, it was a little bit longer than a blurb. So you yeah, know, it was. if you want to read that, it is in the book. Yeah. And it is high, high praise from one of our oldest uh, um, poet laureates, former poet laureate of North Carolina, and uh, a really good guitar player and singer. Shelby is. <laughs> He's an all-around entertainer. Yeah, he is. He's an all-around entertainer. Good guy, too. Uh, subtitle of the book, Kira, and uh, I'm going to have you read a couple of, uh, of poems out of here. Um, and you've got some stuff that you're going to introduce to the listeners that's new. I do. Okay, so you've got something on the back burner that's coming up. I do. Oh, that's wonderful. First of all, I want to find out, what does the subtitle mean, Poems of Reemerging? What's, uh, what's that telling us? So it's interesting because of when it was published, but I actually started collecting these poems before I entered the contest. So I started collecting these poems pre-COVID, but re-emerging is for me as after a divorce and moving to a new place and making uh, changing careers, a lot of big changes in my life. I went through a period of really cocooning and then re-emerging out into the world as a different person, a big period of growth. But as I was in the middle of writing this book really for myself, not knowing it would ever be published, COVID happened and we were locked down and I had cocooned only to emerge prematurely and then have to cocoon back again. Mm -hmm. And so some of the poems um, have meaning for everyone who went through that experience, not just people who've had large life changes, uh, which was originally what I was writing about. That's marvelous because one of the poems, the one called The Warmth of the Neighborhood, um, that poem resonates differently post-COVID. Do you think so? I wrote it for the contest, so that was written in 2021. Oh, that was oh, the contest right. winner. It was, so that okay, was written. That's what I thought. Yeah. So, so there's a mix of poems that were written pre-COVID and like during the middle of COVID, um, and even the period in right before the book was published where I, we had some hope that maybe um, things would let up. So there's all of that is, is in there. and. It's interesting, when I read through it, I know which ones were COVID-inspired, but I, I don't know that other people would be able to tell. Do you mind, that, uh, that's, that poem is on page 12. Could you take a few minutes and read that to absolutely. the listeners, please? Because it's absolutely a great piece of work. And if you're anything like me and you tend to be visual as you read, you're going to see yourself in it. and. It, it brings you through. It's a, it's a roller coaster ride. Yeah, and, a, and, a, and again, it resonates differently uh, during COVID, and you read it now after COVID, after we're somewhat free from it, and it's an entirely different thing. So here is Kira Freeman 
with the warmth of neighborhood. On our front porch, I pause to breathe in the warmth of neighborhood. The Sunday solo of redemption soars from the parking lot as a little sister holds ribbons while a big sister brushes, releasing stray strands of long black hair to the birds. A football lobbed into six-year-old hands, wobbles, and bounces around the corner. That wooden fence that I had erected does not obscure the tang of lit charcoal or the memory of the neighbor grilling shirtless. A cat steals outside to lie in wait under parked cars, and my muzzle-blackened dog digs out a flowerbed tennis ball. The cruiser asleep on the lawn signals that the policeman is off today. A mother and grown daughters in pink and purple sneakers chase each other for another lap around the block as lace curtains part across the street. Pollen speckled water from a lovingly washed truck winds snake-like into our yard. The warm breeze tags along as the groceries and I head inside. Sometimes the days of ease give way. The door is closed against the claws of fear and the porch stands empty. Darkness descends and transforms into those nights when my purse is stolen from my unlocked car, when an unknown van slowing by our house makes my husband's heart race, when the ambulance flashers sudden reflection is magnified in black windows, when a helicopter and a gunshot echo inside the city limits, when we do not feel safe enough to shake hands. Those nights will give rise to morning and bring walking dogs and Wednesday trash cans on the curb, and Eugene's mail truck squeaking as it rounds the corner. We neighbors will wave and stop the chat and reintroduce ourselves. Someone will mount the steps to leave a gift on our front porch. Thank you, isn't that just marvelous? I mean, how prescient that it was written before the COVID lockdown. This one was not. Oh, this one was not. This one was written in um, 2021, in March of 2021, for the contest. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, it was written during, it during was. the job. Now, some of them were written uh, before, so. But the, the lines about, you know, too afraid to shake hands and reintroducing ourselves and things like that, that's a lot of... Uh, that's a lot of what we feel. But also, too, if you were to even take COVID out of it, it still looks like something that resembles to me a neighborhood. And it resembles that, uh, that fear we have at night and those kind of things. Just, just really, really accessible and, and nice alliterations you've got in there as well. So why did you decide to have images in with the book as well? Lots of poets, we've published lots of poets and only got a few who have asked to have images uh, included in, including a new one we've got coming from Kid K. Jenkins called Drinking with Others, Poetry by the Pint. He added images to his. Why did you decide to add those images? My original degree 100,000 years ago was in studio art. And my dream at that time uh, was to publish a children's book and be the illustrator. Um, I have 25 years as a school librarian, much of the time reading picture books. And so I just, text and images go together for me. Also, the way I write is like a visual artist writes. Um, I really draw from images in my writing, and uh, I hope that people can picture them in their mind. And that's what I was saying about that particular poem you just read. As I read it, I see myself and my neighborhood and my husband in our home and how what we do at night and pray for the morning to both be around. So, I mean, I, I really do visualize everything that you, you put into words. I had fun. I gave a copy of this to uh, Eugene, the mailman, since his, he's mentioned by name. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the neighbor grilling shirtless has since died of COVID. So oh. this is really about my neighborhood. Um, and the feelings that I have about it are, for me, I try to put them in the poem. Yes, your stuff is very visual. Where is the, um, what is the poem where you, where you write? It's the, the first line of it is, learn to love the broken. 
Uh, one woman, oh, one woman's trash. One woman's trash. Yeah, this is a marvelous poem. Uh, and the first line says, learn to love the broken. What is that, what is that telling us? I'm learning to love myself even though I'm broken. So that is a piece of it for, for, uh, for me when I wrote that. My process is so very intuitive that it's sometimes difficult to pick apart and the layers may not be evident to other people, but they are to me. It's also about um, a family member who is a hoarder and about changing lives and moving 900 miles with a very small moving pot and needing to figure out um, what to keep and what to throw away and why. I think, I think what touches me about that is, is because it combines this very personal and uh, literary line of learn to love the broken. Then you go into that absolute imagery you're talking about where it says the cup with the chip, the bowl with the hairline crack only visible from the inside. So you've got these two real things combined with something that is kind of abstract in a way to learn to love the broken. And of course, the poem goes on to talk about, you know, you, you've got a line in there that says, but I need to be needed to mend, to fix, to clean, to rehome, and to feel better than those chipped cups in my cabinet. So the marvelous imagery that is in there is what drew me to this, to this book and these poems combined with that feeling of hopefulness in that reemerging. So what have you got coming up? So I'm working on another collection of poetry and doing my best to also do images. Uh, the working title of that is Little Spills and Other Poems That I Can't Contain. Oh, that's a great title. <laughs> Little <laughs> Spills like and Other other poems that I cannot contain, that I cannot or contain. I can't contain. I don't know if I'll do can't or cannot. You know, okay. editing is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of editing, who who does your editing? Do you self-edit? Do you have other people read your poems? Um, so for some insight, I read them at Adventure Bound Books. Uh, they have a poetry uh, event, um, which when it is monthly, there's one on Friday, and I have a group of friends, and we read each other's. Uh, poetry. We don't edit, though. Most of the editing, editing I actually do myself. It's somewhat tricky, but uh, I do very, I mean, people read them, but when I read them out loud, as a storyteller, I can kind of tell, okay, does this work? Are people reacting the way I think that I wanted them to or not. And so I do a lot of editing, of reading things that I think are finished, and then I read them out loud, and they're not actually finished. It's interesting. So this group, actually, I dedicated the book to this. We call ourselves the Wild Wildebeest, Wild Wildebeest Poetry Society. Uh, this group of friends, we did, even though there wasn't anything happening at the bookstore, we did a weekly poetry Zoom all during lockdown. Thank God for that Zoom thing. Those people, they probably made a ton of money off of everybody, but... The silver lining of COVID, <laughs> one of the few. One of the few. Because a lot of us would have been really, really isolated if we hadn't had that, uh, that Zoom software to be able to work with. We frequently use the phrase, the reader, or the writer writes, the reader reads, and I'm hearing you say the listener listens, because it's not a question of just reading poems. When you read it, you know that your words resonate to an audience and you, you're able to read it, listen, and see how your audience reacts as well. So there's a self-editing thing built in just to Absolutely. Help. One of the experiences of having worked as a um, school librarian, um, teacher librarian, uh, for so many years is I've really gotten the sense that reading uh, and reading aloud is an act of connection and an act of sharing, um, and it's very fluid and changeable and a real sense of audience. In fact, I've taught students about audience and how to do presentations and how to write um, and how to tell stories. Um, that kind of gets into the fact that you are a storyteller. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing? I've seen you dressed up in costume. So that's, a, that's its own thing, Miss Kira. Well, I haven't done a lot of in-person storytelling um, recently. 
I do have one coming up. I'll be telling some spooky stories for adults in October. Uh, they moved the date. I can't self, I can't promote it because the date got changed and I've forgotten which date it is. It's October 11th or October 18th. We will put that up on our website. <laughs> yeah, for you, you just let us know. At yeah. a, um, a local public library. The secretary of the Asheville, Story, uh, Asheville Storytelling Circle. Um, and I learned to tell stories mostly as a, uh, as a librarian um, and as a teacher. And then I started really getting obsessed with the moth on NPR and started to write, instead of just doing traditional stories, started to write um, autobiographical stories and um, did some story slams, none of which I won, but it's always good experience. Poetry comes from a long tradition of oral uh, uh, sharing. It's how they remembered the stories before, way before there was ever writing and, and being able to do things. They, they kept their stories by oral tradition and a lot of times rhyming words and making them into to, uh, couplets and into verses was the way they remembered them. Like you can remember a song very easily if you sing it. One of the things that's terrific about your poetry is I've got to admit that a lot of poetry I have to read it aloud and hear it in my own ears from my own voice to where I can really get out of it what is there. In your stuff, you do such a good job with your word placement and your punctuation and the way you design your stanzas and your verses that when I have heard you read a poem, it's exactly the way I read it. You have structured it to where I am able to read it aloud with the same inflection and the same uh, tones that you read it. Do you do that on purpose or is that just something that comes from the fact that you're coming from a storytelling background? I think that comes from background. Um, it also comes from most of my experience with poetry is sharing it with children. I've read so many poems aloud. Um, I've had some, a couple of people tell me who know me that they don't really like poetry, but they really enjoy reading what I write. I don't know why that is. I'm happy that they're reading it, and I'm happy that maybe it's a foot in the door to poetry. But then I think about how many years I tried to find poems that would be a foot in the door for children to enjoy poetry. And so probably I just write like that because it's what I've read the most. And I'm not afraid to say that your poetry is very accessible. Mm. It's very accessible. It's very personal. You can see yourself in it as a reader. But also, too, you're not trying to do anything fancy. You're not trying to do anything that will test the reader in understanding. It's very clear. So I think that, too, is part of what makes it uh, uh, really good poetry. Do you want to give us something, uh, an example from the upcoming? I do. You got something that you'd like to do? Uh, Remember, we said keep it PG-13, so, you know, we might. <laughs> right. One of the things that... <laughs> so most of my... Poetry uh, post-2018, uh, when I left the public school system, was all part of my lesson plans and written with or for children um, as examples. And I don't even have any of it anymore. Uh, and it has been really freeing to actually be able to write as an adult woman and not censor myself um, to make sure that things are. So not everything I write is PG-13 or... PG at all. All right, let me look. Something you mentioned, and I really like this, Robert, about Kara's poems being accessible. I always make the kind of like the dividing line between poetry. You've got your Les Browns, you've got your Kara Freeman. As I read it, I can visualize it, I can feel it, and it resonates. Then you've got your Al McGinnis, who I adore, but he makes me fight for it, you know? It's, it's like right. reading a crossword puzzle or, you know, New York Times. <laughs> you know, it's like I really right. have to dig into it. And I like that. That stretches me. Um, and I like them both. But I, like I say, Kara, as a woman also of a certain age, it's like when I read hers, I, I feel right in place as I hear them. So. Yeah, one of the first classes I taught of poetry here at Catawba Valley Community College is I said, okay, folks, we're going to start our poetry unit, and they all groaned. 25 of them groaned at the same time, and I just said, now look, you're not going to like every poem you read, and you're not going to like every poet, but there are poems and poets out there who will speak to you if you know how to read it. So one of the things we did in there was we taught 
uh, the students how to read a poem, what a poem does. That's where I came in contact with Gwendolyn Brooks and Langston Hughes and, and their poets like Kira that are very accessible. They say what's in their heart and therefore it hits your heart instead of going through your mind. A lot of times it hits your heart. So, Kira, you found one. I found so many. It's hard to decide. Um, I thought this whole time you were looking for the ones that weren't blue. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. I only have a—I only really in the book, actually, um, the Second Life book, there is one. Uh, And maybe— and it's not that it's a rap song, so it speaks with that language. Right. This is not um, this this um, is not yet published. It's called Detour Home. An alien, a visitor from another life, I navigate the airport rental car with a push button start sequence that took me a full ten minutes to crack. I am in the wrong lane for the turn, and I wonder if I should have linked my phone to the car and had it calculate correct directions. I drive. I drive until the street names return from my unconscious. My body knows the precise tilt of every mountain turn, how the road dips here, and the familiar thrill of driving blind over the crest of the late afternoon hill where the potholes form every year, and where the deer, heedless of the yellow signs, actually cross the road, and the place that the tractor will turn off in a mile or so, the exact speed to make my stomach lurch over that next rise, the ill-conceived traffic circle where the milk truck once overturned on a patch of early spring ice, and the river of milk flowed to join Otter Creek, the place where the state trooper hides among the farm vehicles, on the back way to Burlington, and where the peepers sing the loudest in the dark as the pavement becomes dirt. These things are still written beneath my skin. That's going to be a a good one. Got time for one more? This one is in the book, and it is a portrait. Uh, Some of the poems that I write are portraits. Uh, This one is called Hello and Goodbye, Mr. Dave. How do you say goodbye when you never really said hello? I can count the conversations I have had with you in 45 years on one hand. And yet, I remember your hands being so much a part of my life. The little girl me, maybe four, remembers the barn full of groceries and the orange summer day lilies of your sisters in Cornwall. My parents picked up supplies to feed us as I stayed out of the way. I remember you your long brown hair moving in the summer breeze. No, your own constant movements rippling out to your hippie's hair, sunlight glinting from your glasses. You talked earnestly about saving the world from doom. Your hands gestured to the ground, air, the mountains, while handing us our food. I remember my mom working at the bike and ski center, she who could neither bike nor ski. The piles of papers, were deep as the stairs to the office were steep. The creaking old wooden floors were flecked with bike grease and ski wax and the smell of bike tires mixing with a click, click, click when I turned the pedals. Your hands adjusted the training wheels for me, helped with the brakes. I still use the skis we bought from you decades ago, and I think of you every time. That parade when you rode the bicycle from a hundred years ago with a giant front tire, the playing card bicycle, I thought you were the coolest dude ever. You mounted that enormous thing with such grace, and in my memory you were even dressed for the part. I remember you as my father's friend. You rivaled him in grouchiness. You both loved machines of any kind, and the two of you would talk about them the way my mother talked to her friends about people and babies. The motorcycle with the sidecar that you let my father borrow left me in abject terror. I did not think that one should move so fast, so close to the ground. My sister wanted to ride again. I was told that you were shy. I thought that you didn't like children or people in general, and somehow... You kept ending up surrounded by a tribe. I remember you at Quaker meetings, sitting in the silence with your mind whirring. Overpopulation, war, pollution, nuclear power, big misses. David Tear got arrested again, protesting again, I remember people saying. 
I imagine you handcuffed, tear-gassed, behind barbed wire, but everyone around me seemed to think it was no big deal. By the time I was in high school, I knew you as the grouchy, generous man who took in the outcasts, mentored the misfits, your hands fed strays, the animal and the human alike. The heated monologues about the perils of the world were at odds with the joyous bouncing of your feet at contradances. We all remember you eating a pint of Ben and Jerry's and spotting you on a bike all over the Champlain Valley on the same day. As my old car struggled up the Ripton Gap on the way to Boston, I would come around a corner to find you on your bicycle steadily climbing like the Tour de France. And then you became Mr. Dave of Grandma Donna and Mr. Dave, tandem bike racing duo. I still do not understand your patience as you pulled her up and down all of those Vermont hills. Boat motors appeared in the shed at my mom's house. National Geographics in the bookshelves, wooden toys and new bicycles under the Christmas tree. The magnificent Studebaker and Pogo the Boat joined the family too. Your hands came to hold my daughters. You shepherded them on adventures outside. My own little girls remember you helping with training wheels and brakes and tires. When I saw you this summer, I still didn't wave. I just pointed you out to my friend. There is Mr. Dave on his bike. He's kind of my stepfather. I had no idea what to say when I sat down next to you on the front porch and watched the sky. I have gotten so used to you just being here that I come around the corner at a hardware store 900 miles away and I see hippie's hair graying under a bright stocking cap with a winter beard and glasses, the barrel chest atop the athlete's legs, and I always think it might be you. Hello and goodbye, Mr. Dave. Is that like a, what do you call it when you speak at someone's funeral? It's a eulogy. It's, it's a eulogy, eulogy to somebody who was very important to you? Yes, someone who I really never understood his importance in my life uh, until I sat down to write about it. I got it very emotional. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually tearing up. And you know what it is? All of us have a Mr. Dave in our life, if we're fortunate. We all have somebody like that in our life. That silent person yeah. who supports you. You've just taken for granted. And you just don't, you don't even realize it. Yeah. See, that's the kind of thing that I told you about when we got this in. Yeah. I said this resonates with the human condition much more than I ever expected it to. Yeah. You know, I, we've got such talented people here in this part of North Carolina and in the whole state, and we were very, very fortunate to uh, to find Kira Freeman uh, from this contest, and we look forward to what you're going to do for us next. I like how you how you talk about him on a bicycle with the big front wheel, mm -hmm. and you avoid using the word velocipede because it probably would have confused the reader. But uh, that's what you're talking about, right? It's exactly what the I'm talking about. Card the bike. playing card bicycle. Yeah. I mean, I can use different words. I guess working with children for such a long time, um, I try to be as direct as possible while at the same time being multi-layered for people who can understand it. See, that's the, that's the genius of it. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the part of it that makes it accessible and makes people not turn away from it when you mention the word poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. because you say you just need to read this, read it. And, you know, if nothing else, read it out loud to yourself and you'll hear it. You know, you'll hear the, the crunchiness of it. You'll hear the alliteration of it. But also, too, you will hear something about your own life in it, even though you've never met the poet. And so much literature, its legs, what makes it last a long time is because of those things. And you've, you, you've tapped into it in, in spades. So uh, thank you for being a Red Hawk Publications poet. And we do have to give props to Dr. Angela Shores, owner of Adventure Bound Books in Morganton, North Carolina, because she brought us you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode. We'll come to you later on with some more COVID uh, uh, episodes with uh, promotion for books we did during the COVID outbreak. Uh, for now, we want to say goodbye to Kira Freeman and thank you for being here. Patty Thompson is also 
saying goodbye. She's looking at me now like, what the hell are you doing? So you know, I'm still wiping <laughs> my tears from Mr. David. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you guys out there for joining us at Red Pub Pod. Let's hear you say it. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. And y'all take care. This has been Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. A podcast. Red Pub Pod. From Red Hog Publications. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. That's how you say it.